Their love was forbidden. Most nights after the last bells, they snuck out to see each other anyway, meeting in a field halfway between his monastery and her nunnery. They decided to elope and run away together, but they were caught. They were separated and punished for their sins. She was forced to watch while he was hung. She was imprisoned in a tiny room in a dark corner of the monastery. Brick by brick, they sealed her in a tomb as she begged for mercy. Afterwards, tapping could be heard from the wall. The taps slowly grew fainter and fainter until they stopped. Or so goes the legend of the secret, doomed love affair between a monk and a nun. Since then, the spirit of the nun has allegedly roamed the land that her lover's Benedictine monastery once stood on. There are some that believe that the ghosts of Borley Rectory have little to do with the house itself, but existed before the house was constructed. In fact, the local antiquarian claims that they found old accounts of ghostly activity that date back to 1819. Others claim the ghost sightings didn't start until after Borley Rectory was built. The only thing that's agreed upon is that unexplainable things happened at Borley Rectory. In 1862, Borley Rectory was constructed for the Reverend Henry Dawson Ellis Bull and his family after he was named rector of Borley Parish in a rural corner of Essex, England. Over time, the Gothic brick house continued to be enlarged as Reverend Bull had 14 children and needed space for all of them. Ultimately, there were 23 rooms connected by three different staircases on two main floors, plus a cellar and attic space. The house was the perfect setting for a horror movie, gloomy, depressing, and cold. Nearly from the start, the family began hearing rushing water. However, the house didn't have the modern convenience of piped water. Water was drawn from a well outside. Soon the sounds escalated to whispers, tapping, and crashes. Even worse, a ghost seemed to target a particular member of the family. The heavy footsteps stopped in front of the door to her room. Ethel lay in her bed. The sheet pulled up to her chin. She hardly dared to breathe. It was back. She could sense it. The invisible presence lurking outside her door. For the past several weeks, she hadn't gotten much sleep. It always began the same way. Footsteps clumping down the hall to her room, but no one was there. Then it whispered and knocked at her door. Ethel laid stiff in bed, trying to ignore it, waiting until it went away. Sometimes it stayed out there until dawn. Knock, knock, knock. It rapped on her door. Some nights Ethel had to call for her parents, but of course they found nothing and scolded her for being silly. Bang, bang, bang. The knocks were getting louder. It was angry. Suddenly, the locked door exploded open and a puff of air blew into the room. Her limbs frozen with dread. Ethel shut her eyes tightly. She wasn't going to look. Crack. Ethel's cheeks suddenly bloomed in a burst of hot pain. It had slapped her. For whatever reason, a poltergeist seemed to focus on Ethel, even slapping her as she lay in bed. But she wasn't the only target. In 1886, a new nursemaid, Elizabeth Byford, initially joked about the fact that the room allotted to her was haunted. However, a few weeks later, she woke at midnight to the sound of slippered footsteps outside her door, but no one was there. She gave notice the next day. No matter if locals shared rumors about seeing ghostly figures wandering the grounds of Borley House, the Bull family refused to be scared off. July 28, 1900. It was a warm evening as Ethel and her sister Frida walked home after a summer party. They giggled as they traded tidbits of gossip about the event. Suddenly, Frida stopped in her tracks. Look, she whispered. Emerging from the trees onto the rectory yard was a female figure, her head bowed. She was dressed head to toe in a black habit. She seemed to glide over the grass rather than walk. Elise, whispered Ethel, and took off running toward the rectory. Frida followed. Elise had recently complained that she never saw the ghostly nun and wanted to see her. They soon found Elise and quickly dragged her outside. Surprisingly, the nun was still there, floating across the edge of the lawn. Elise stepped toward her, not sure whether to be scared or fascinated. She was just about to call to her when the nun faded away in front of her eyes. Apparently, the ghostly nun was seen so frequently the area where she roamed began to be referred to as the nun's walk. After Reverend Bull's death in 1892, his son, also named Henry, took over his duties as rector. One spring afternoon, Henry was pacing back and forth in the garden, working out a new sermon. Suddenly, his retriever juvenile, who'd been napping under a bush, got to his feet and growled. The dog was staring at something. Henry turned to look. Someone was standing in the orchard. He could see a pair of legs peeking out from the leaves of a tree. Henry raised his hand and started to shout hello, but the sound died in his throat. As the legs walked out from behind the brush, he saw that the body they belonged to was headless. He watched in silent horror as the headless ghost strode across the garden and walked clean through a locked gate. Henry and other locals also saw a ghostly carriage drawn by two horses and driven by a headless coachman on several different occasions. Even more strange was when the coach was seen, it was silent. Other times, when the clip-clop of the horse hooves and the sound of the heavy wheels on the road were heard, the coach itself was invisible. Apparently, Henry was fascinated by the idea of a ghostly nun and built a summer cottage with a view of the nun's walk so he could look out for the nun taking a stroll. Henry was the rector for Borley Parish until his death in 1927. Unfortunately, there are no more members of the Bull family who wanted the parish position, and it was hard to find a new rector as the Borley house now had a reputation for being haunted.
married. In 1928, Reverend Guy Smith accepted the position. He and his wife Mabel were recently returned from India and didn't know of the local legends. Mabel was appalled when she first saw the house. It was huge for two people, over 60 years old and ramshackle. While clearing out some cupboards as they moved in, Mabel was horrified to find a small human skull wrapped in brown paper packaging. Guy buried the skull in the churchyard. Soon after that, Guy was walking past the blue room in the Borley house, a room known for allegedly haunted activity. A voice whispered at him, pleading, don't Carlos, don't. Guy was left wondering if the ghostly whisper was about the skull. Much like the previous occupants, the Smiths frequently heard eerie footsteps echo around the house, knocking and whispering voices. In fact, footsteps were heard in the rectory so often that one day Reverend Smith leapt out from behind a wall with a hockey stick to strike the intruder, only to find himself slicing thin air. The rectory was fitted with old-fashioned pole bells attached to ropes. If a rope was pulled in various rooms, the kitchen would be alerted. The bells went off frequently, even when they were disconnected. Eagerly to put a stop to the local tales and perhaps convince themselves that there were no ghosts, in 1929 the Smiths wrote to the Daily Mirror, asking the newspaper for help in contacting the Society for Psychical Research (SPR). The paper sent out journalist V.C. Wall and a photographer to lurk in the woods behind Borley Rectory to see if they could see anything. Unfortunately, they did not see any ghosts, but they did spy a light on in the rectory. When someone went inside the house, there was no light on, yet outside they could see it. Hordes of curious onlookers descended upon the area having read the newspaper. On June 11th, SPR sent psychical researcher Harry Prince to investigate Borley Rectory. Over the course of several days, Harry witnessed many unexplainable things, including eerie footsteps, pebbles bouncing down the stairs, and a red glass candlestick that whizzed past his head and shattered against an iron stove. Not long afterwards, the Smiths, unable to deal with their living circumstances anymore, quickly moved out, having been at Borley Parish for less than a year. The house stood empty for about six months before the Reverend Lionel Foister, his much younger wife Marianne, and their toddler daughter, Adelaide, arrived in 1930. From the beginning, the family was besieged with whispers, mysterious footsteps, and ringing bells, but the poltergeist activity seemed to get stronger. There were sudden smells of perfume, furniture was shifted, household items vanished, random items appeared. The ghosts liked to move things, including making bottles fall and throwing pebbles. Windows were broken and Adelaide was mysteriously locked in a room to which there was no key. The regular ghosts were also seen, including the nun and the headless man. Again, the poltergeist focused on one person, Marianne. Allegedly, she was thrown on a bed several times. Once, a flying item struck her so hard she was left with a black eye and a cut face. Beginning in 1931, mysterious messages began to appear on scraps of paper in the walls of the house, some targeting her. One particular message addressed to Marianne pleaded for rest and mass prayers. Many of the messages were scrawled in a manic fashion and were intelligible. Harry Price visited Borley Rectory a few times while the Foisters were there to follow up on his paranormal investigations. Reverend Foister kept a diary of unexplained happenings at Borley. He didn't seem faced by the paranormal activity. He only left his position after five years in 1935 because of his advanced arthritis. By this time, the church had enough of Borley Rectory and they gave up trying to find someone to take over. They merged the parish with a nearby one and put Borley Rectory up for sale. In 1937, Harry Price rented the house for one year. He wanted to study the ghosts. On May 2, 1937, he placed an advertisement in the Times, Haunted House, responsible persons of leisure and intelligence, intrepid, critical, and unbiased, are invited to join Rhoda of observers in a year's day and night investigation of alleged house. He ended up hiring 50 employees, predominantly students working weekends, as official observers. Harry and his team conducted a variety of experiments within the house, recording instances of perceived paranormal phenomena, such as knocking, bell ringing, and movement of objects. He also brought in several mediums and conducted seances. The most notable seance occurred on March 27, 1938. Medium Helen Glanville allegedly made successful contact with a nun and an unidentified male spirit. The male spirit predicted that the rectory would be destroyed by fire in exactly one year and that a nun's body would be found amongst the ruins. In the autumn of 1938, Borley was purchased by Captain William Hart Gregson at a steal for 500 pounds, or around 33,524 pounds, or $47,500 in today's money. Gregson had insured it for 10,000 pounds, or about 665,831 pounds, or 943,610 US dollars in today's money. He renamed the house the Priory and planned to cash in on the rectory's spooky history and turn the house into a tourist stop. However, on February 27, 1939, exactly nine months after the eerie prediction, Captain Gregson was moving into the property. Allegedly, while sorting through some books at the house, he saw a stack of them fall, despite being firmly placed on the table. The books knocked over a paraffin lamp, spilling oil across the floor, which then ignited. By the time the fire brigade arrived, the house was well ablaze. The firemen extinguished the flames, but not before they destroyed the upper story and damaged most
most of the rooms on the ground floor. A policeman who had attended the fire later questioned Captain Gregson about the identity of the lady and gentleman in cloaks he had seen leaving the house as it was burning. However, he assured the policeman that he was the only person at the rectory. Upon investigation, the insurance company decided Gregson deliberately set the house on fire and refused to pay out. The house was left as a ruin, never to be rebuilt. After the fire, Harry Price searched the ruins for the body of the nun. While digging in the cellar, he found part of a jawbone and a skull, which he claimed belonged to the nun. However, others claimed the bones belonged to a pig. Although the local vicar of Borley refused to allow the Christian burial of the bones, the church at nearby Liston did. The ruins of the gutted rectory were finally demolished in 1944. However, that didn't end the supernatural phenomena. During World War II, army officers using the grounds of Borley Rectory had stones thrown at them, but when they investigated, there was no one there. They also felt incredibly uneasy, like they were being watched by some eerie unseen presence. Their feelings of discomfort were so great, they abandoned the site early. From 1947 to 1950, James and Alice Turner lived in the summer cottage, which hadn't been affected by the fire. Though there were no children around, they would hear the shrieks and laughter of children playing in the orchard. On one occasion, they heard the sound of heavy footsteps on the wooden floor of their cottage. During a 1961 paranormal investigation, all the flashlights, as well as the car headlights belonging to the investigators, all failed without obvious cause. Harry Price died in 1948, having written two books about Borley House, one borrowing extensively from Reverend Foister's diary of paranormal activity in the house. Over the years, accusations of fraud have arisen from skeptics, investigators, and associates of Price's. It's thought he fabricated much of the paranormal phenomena that occurred. Later in life, Mary Ann Foister would publicly admit that she had never experienced anything supernatural within the house. She faked the hauntings to cover up an affair she was having with the lodger. The house was old and creaky, so it was easy to play on people's fears. An alleged friend of the Bull family, Louis Mayerling, published a book in 2000 discussing how, as a child, he helped them fake hauntings. Apparently, Reverend Bull found it funny to stoke rumors of ghosts. It worked. According to Lewis, at one point, the London papers reported daily on the Borley house. Tourists came from as far away as America to drive past the house. Lewis also helped the Foisters fake hauntings. He claimed that they struggled to make ends meet and decided that boosting the ghostly reputation of Borley was a good side hustle to earn cash. Sometimes Lewis would walk the gardens at dusk wearing a black cape to give rise to the myth of the headless monk. So, was Borley house really haunted? We began with the story of how the ghostly nun came to be wandering the Borley estate. There are several very variations of her story. Many believe that there never was a ghostly nun. Reverend Bull's children borrowed her from a book. We only have Lewis Mayerling saying that he helped to fake the sightings. Too much time has passed to verify his claims. One Borley enthusiast compiled a report of several hundred paranormal experiences taking place over the last 150 years. In more recent times, people have continued to have inexplicable experiences in the area where Borley Rectory once stood. In 2000, a television crew recorded hollow footsteps, the creaking of a door that no longer exists, and a deep sigh that impressed everyone who heard it as profoundly unhappy. While the Borley Rectory property is now private, ghost hunters film in and around the nearby Borley Church, which the rectors served. Often things happen such as stones thrown out of nowhere, ghostly whispers or cameras recording correctly, but when later watching the footage always end up being corrupt. Some describe seeing a little boy in Victorian clothing and a cloaked figure glide across the field. We are at least willing to say that there are forces at work in Borley Parish for which there is no explanation. What happened to the crew of the cursed ship, the Mary Celeste. Click here to learn their tragic and mysterious fate. The prize for surviving McCamey Manor is still up for grabs. Do you think you can withstand the disturbing tour of this haunted house?